and I got a bronze medal at the European Championships just before Rio. And I was like, I've qualified for Rio. This is amazing. This is like everything I've wanted to do in my career so far. And I was only 17, so it was like, it was really positive. And then the tournament had finished and my coach came up to me and said, like so someone who's protested against you, basically, you're going to have to go for reclassification. Do you find yourself winging your way through life, hoping you'll figure it all out on the way? Hello, it's me, Gabby Mendez, your 20s wing woman, and you're listening to the Talk 20s podcast. Here you'll find me chatting to influential 20-somethings on different topics that matter to you in your 20s and all the things we never got taught in school. This is your ultimate guide to adult life. So if you're ready, let's go. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Talk 20s podcast. This week I'm joined in the studio by Paralympic bronze medalist Billy Shilton. Hi Billy, welcome to the studio. Thanks so much for coming on the Talk 20s podcast. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you here because we actually... We don't just know each other because you're a Paralympic yeah, bronze yeah. medalist. We actually know each other from way, way back when we were really, really young because we come from like the smallest town, Tiny, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. Tiniest, weeniest town in, in Gloucestershire. And uh, yeah, like growing up, you were, you played football with my brother yeah. and uh, your mum used to cut my hair, which is, which is really nice memories and stuff like that. But like, I think it's amazing. And I just want to say like how proud I am of yeah, you, you for much. achieving what you have done. And because you're only 23 and last, last summer you went to Tokyo Paralympics. Tell us all about it. Yeah, I think it's obviously an unbelievable experience and, and to come away with a medal is, is something that, you know, I've been dreaming of since I was a kid. So yeah, it was like eight years leading up to that moment and to finally get there was, I was really, really happy. Yeah. I mean, I said, it's an incredible achievement and I think there was so much that, you know, was building up to that moment as well. Like so much of things that you've experienced in those eight years that have challenged you, have really pushed you to to get to where you are. So I think it is, it is an amazing achievement. Yeah. If we take it back then and take it right back to kind of Billy, when you were diagnosed um, at five years old, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think it was something that, that didn't really, really affect me until sort of sort of school school age I think my, my disability is called Charcot Marie Tooth Disease and it sort of progressively gets worse as as you get older so it wasn't actually something that that affected me too much when when I was a kid and it was it was not until I stopped playing football where I really realized it did actually affect me a lot more than it originally did when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things that like especially like growing up you I know how passionate because my brother was the same yeah, yeah. you absolutely adored football and so there was a moment where you kind of realised that you, you couldn't do the thing that you loved anymore. And I know you're massively still into your football yeah, yeah, yeah. and you love watching it and stuff like that. How did that kind of change into being a table tennis player? Because that's your sport now, isn't it? Yeah, I think it was it was quite difficult because obviously like my emotional, I, w I, was, I wasn't really too sure sort of how to take it at that age because I was still really young. But a lot of credit to my dad, really. I think the transition that that he took with me was it was a big step for him and a big step for me. I obviously, like you said, love playing football and it was a, it was a really difficult decision to make it at such a young age that that was sort of what I wanted to do in in my future career. So it was it was a big decision, but yeah, that's something definitely that uh, that, I'm, that I'm happy to have done. Mm -hmm. so your dad your dad was a table tennis player, which is how you got into yeah. it, right? And like, how how on earth did you kind of realize? Okay, I think I've got I've got a bit of skill for this. It was when I started beating my dad. He's not going to like that I said that. But <laughs> it was no, it was just it was one of those things where I, I actually picked it up quite quickly. Um, I was I was sort of yeah like I said I stopped playing football and and my dad just took me over to Worcester Tail Tennis Club which is where I played before I moved to Sheffield and and he just said look just just come and watch and and, and see what you think and I, I really 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 loved it just straight away really my dad got me on the table after the match and and I just fell in love with it instantly so yeah it was it was a blessing really mm -hmm. and like you played kind of all throughout your teens like you started off really really young and then when you're 15 you got the opportunity to move to Sheffield to kind of play professionally. Yeah, yeah. What was that What was that decision for you and your family? Like, how did that come about? And like, looking back now, like, is that something that you really think was an important part of your journey? Yeah, I think it, it was massive for my personal development, even as a person as well. I think I learned so much when I moved to Sheffield. I was a bit, you know, I didn't really know how to cook or clean before I moved. So it was like, even, you know, the small things can make such a big difference. But it was a difficult decision, to be honest, I think. I was still in school and it was one of those things where, you know, if I don't, if I don't move now, will I get this opportunity again? I was still studying at the time. So it was a difficult decision, but my parents helped me out so much. They just said, look, they, they didn't pressure me into anything. They said, like, do what makes you happy and, you know, what you think's best. And, and that's the decision that I made. Mm -hmm. I think like for, for, to think that you're going to move away at 15, that's, that's quite a big thing for a yeah, lot of people. Yeah. Like most of us, it's kind of 18 or maybe a little bit older that we start moving away from home. Like, Obviously, this podcast is all about 
talk 20s and like the things you have to do to be an adult. But realistically, you probably experience quite a lot of that stuff at 15, but also like with a disability as well. Yeah, like, yeah. did you find that challenging? Like, yeah, I think it was, it was, it was difficult. I think obviously managing my disability and doing all these things like moving away from home, I think. I think it was worrying at the start, to be honest. I didn't really know how I would cope, but the players in Sheffield, I was living with my two teammates that I won the medal with in, in Tokyo, Aaron and Ross, and they were so, so supportive. And mm. yeah, it really made that transition a, a lot easier for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so talk to us a little bit more about kind of how your your kind of journey has been in that in that time, because I know from from speaking to you that you've had not like the easiest journey to kind of Tokyo. Yeah. Um, you know, you had um, some challenges. You were trying to qualify for Rio as well four years earlier or five years earlier because yeah, yeah. of the p- p- pandemic. Um, so tell us a little bit more about how it's not been a straight straightforward journey to kind of be a, a Paralympic table tennis bronze medalist. You've had to overcome a lot yeah. of hurdles in order to do that. Like obviously the first one being moving away from home at 15 and having to figure all of that out. Like, has there been any other kind of hurdles and difficulties that you've faced in that time? Yeah, I think the uh, the reclassification, I'll, I'll go into it in a little bit more detail in a second, but I was I was competing in a class. So it basically is, is six to 10 in like standing table tennis. So the severity of your disability sort of determines which class you're in. So I was in class seven at the time and I got a bronze medal at the European Championships just before Rio. And I was like, I've qualified for Rio. This is amazing. This is like everything I've wanted to do in my career so far. And I was only 17. So it was like, it was really positive. And mm-hmm. then the tournament had finished and my coach came up to me and said, like so someone he's protested against you, basically, you're going to have to go for reclassification. And I wasn't, I wasn't worried, to be honest. I thought, oh, it will be okay. Like, it's just a quick check and everything will be fine. And then we got to the end of the tournament and they said, look, Billy, like, we're really sorry, but you've been moved up a category. So this is like, basically it affects me. So I was playing, I was competing against more able players, so to speak. So the, the players, the, 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 step, the, land, the standard of level was a lot higher mm-hmm. and the players were a lot better. So it was something that, that really, that really troubled me and eventually didn't, didn't get me over the line to Rio. How mentally, how was that period for you as like an 18 year old that kind of thought, yeah, I'm going to Rio. I'm going to achieve all of this and kind of hopes and dreams to obviously feel that because someone had obviously said like, you shouldn't be in this category and protested against that, that it meant you missed out on, on going to Rio. Like, how did you get over that mentally? Cause I think that's probably quite difficult. It took a very long time to be honest. I think emotionally at the time, like I said, I was only 18 and I was a bit rebellious. You know, I was, I was, I was so angry and I was angry at other people. Like, you know, why, why has this happened to me? It's so unfair. And, and now I think I would look back at it a lot differently. I think I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't be in the position that I am now if it wasn't, wasn't for that. So I'm, I'm very grateful now, but at the time I was, yeah, I was, I was really disappointed and upset to, to not be going, not be going to real. Yeah. Do you think like the fact that it was kind of more, the, the, the difficulty was you were playing more able players, like yeah. the challenge was greater. How was that? You said that has kind of like benefited you now, but how, how actually has that, has that benefited you in the long run? I think it, it I had a conversation with myself, sounds a bit weird actually, but I was speaking to myself just <laughs> in my room, to myself. <laughs> in my, in my room once. And I was just thinking like, like this isn't the end. Like, I'm only 17. Like there's, I have so much mm. to look forward to now. Like what can I, what can I do to, to, to not be in this position again? And there were so many things I spoke to my parents about it. And I just thought like, I, I need to, I need to work harder. I need to do more. And, and that was something that was, it was a difficult decision. Like I, I, I always knew I wanted to be Paralympic champion. I want to be world number one and stuff like that. But I was so angry at the time that I didn't really know like how to do that. And yeah. I think it, it took a lot of conversations with my coaches in Sheffield and, and my family and, and it was something that that has really really pushed me on even as a person as well I've learned so much about myself like how hard I can actually push myself and and how strong I can be mentally and and I feel like that 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 situation that happened has only brought me forward to the position I'm in yeah. now. Yeah I think it's a great deal of like resilience isn't it because you've obviously got such a huge knockback when you were like so close to kind of getting what you yeah. really really wanted at 17 to then kind of be pushed back and to kind of feel not like you have to start again because obviously you've got like a great deal of, of, of ability and what you can do but you know, to kind of feel like you're starting from the beginning again probably felt like really, really tough. You did actually get to go to Rio, but not to compete. Yeah. Um, but when we were talking about it earlier, you said that that kind of has been crucial for you to actually go and experience it and kind of watch what was going on really helped you when you were then in Tokyo five years later. Yeah, so the the, the program's called the Paralympic Inspiration Program. So they select uh, athletes from from different different sports and you basically get to go and and experience what it's like to be at the Paralympics. So I was fortunate enough to be chosen for table tennis and 
yeah, it really helped me. Like, like I said to you before, even, you know, the pressure of being in the table tennis hall, there was so many people in the crowd and even going to the village, like it's so overwhelming. Like I couldn't, I couldn't believe it was so big. There's so many, you know, like there's gyms everywhere. The food hall's like crazy. There's so much mm -hmm. stuff going on. And even then, even I wasn't competing. I was so overwhelmed. And I think if I'd have gone into Tokyo and not experienced that, I think that could have had like a big effect on my performance. I wasn't surprised when I got there. I was like, oh, yeah. like I've seen this stuff before. And and it wasn't it wasn't a massive shot to me. So yeah, I was really fortunate to be yeah. able to go there. We talked a little bit as well about like visualization and how important that is when you're trying to achieve yeah, a goal sure. to kind of imagine yourself somewhere. If you've never seen what that looks like before, how on earth are you supposed to imagine imagine yourself there? So for you going to Rio and even though you weren't competing to kind of experience that, maybe watch your teammates yeah. that you play with back at home go on and do that you can kind of live vicariously through them and then when you're kind of coming up to your turn you go okay I can imagine it I can see it I can I can I can I can do it basically is visualization something that you use as in, in sport or is it is it a just kind of not something that you've got in your toolkit I think it's personal preference to be honest yeah. I think some people you know look at look at their performance in different ways and I think for me I think I think having that initial conversation before you know for example playing a match I'll, I'd like to speak to my coach about okay how are we going to win this game? Is there anything we can do? And then you can sort of picture that in your mind. So for that instance, going to Rio, I knew I knew, I knew everything. I, I saw everything before and mm. I knew what the expectations were of me. And I was just able to, I actually really enjoyed Tokyo. I think a lot of people, you know, it's, it's like for them, it's like the biggest tournament of their lives. And it was obviously huge for me, but I just think, I was thinking to myself at the time, like, I might never get this opportunity again. So I was just like, I just tried to take everything in. And I've said it before to, to, you know, friends and family, like they were like, how did you deal with the pressure? And I was just like, I just enjoyed it. Like it was so, mm. it was so fun to be like at the pinnacle of your career playing in a Paralympic games. And I was just like, I just enjoyed every moment. And I think some people, and I think that actually really helped me. Some people can look at it and, and, you know, be scared by the fact that, you know, they're competing in the Paralympics and they've trained so long and so hard for that specific moment. But mm -hmm. Yeah, it was something that I actually really enjoyed. I came back, obviously delighted with the medal, but I was actually happy with how I sort of performed off the table, you know, like taking everything in and just trying to enjoy it and not letting the pressure get to me. And I think that was something that I really, I really benefited from. I think you've got a really good mindset in terms of when I've been chatting to you is that you really like live in the moment. I think from, from like, you really enjoy it and you really are like, I think because maybe because of the setbacks that you've had in the past, you're, you seem like so grateful for like every, everything that you've got so far and like being able to go to Tokyo and compete. Like you also did really well, like in your individual um, category as well, yeah. not quite on the, on the medal board, but so close as well. And then obviously you've got the, the, the one that you won with your team as well, which is amazing. Like you did so, so, so well. And like, I know you said to me that you came home and you literally were like partying for like a week, <laughs> really enjoying yourself, which is, it, it was just so good. And I, I don't think that, I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't feel like enough as young people that we actually really celebrate our wins like you you know obviously you said you know I want to be well world champion I want to want to win a gold medal one day yep. but at that moment in time you came back from Tokyo and were like I'm really proud of like what I've been able to achieve and you really like celebrated that for a little while um I personally think I don't do that enough I don't think I celebrate my little wins but I think that's and this is not a little win how can I even say that's a little <laughs> win but do you know what I mean coming home and actually being really happy for like what you've achieved is amazing and I think I think all of us should like relish in that a little bit more and you know enjoy the experience because I think like you say like so many of us put so much pressure on ourselves to achieve like you could have you could have put load, a ton more pressure on yourself and that you don't know if that would have been a good thing or a yeah, bad yeah. thing against your uh, your performance so I love that you kind of live in the moment and enjoy it um that being said obviously you've obviously got like ambitions and you've continued training and stuff like that um you went you also went to Spain last week and you and another tournament your first one since Tokyo as well so tell us a little bit more about kind of the build-up and how kind of you get to your kind of get to the Paralympics and how it kind of works yeah so obviously Paralympics are every four years and you have you have tournaments along the way you probably we sort of play four or five tournaments a year in in various countries and then you have to be a certain world ranking uh to qualify for a Paralympics or a world championships for example so there's a world championships at the end of the year in uh, in Spain so the aim is to is to qualify for that I'm just in at the moment but there's a couple of tournaments still left so I'm there that's my that's my focus at the moment just mm -hmm. focusing on qualifying for the worlds and then It'll be Paris at Paris after that. Mm -hmm. And you spend like obviously um, 
part of like uh, training and stuff like that. You spend all your time in Sheffield. Um, you train with the rest of your teammates there. Um, you you mentioned to me before like how much your coaches have had a real big impact in your journey and how if you didn't have the coaches that you'd have had, you'd never be where you are. Is there something in particular that you kind of feel like your coaches have kind of really drawn out of you or really worked with you on that you kind of feel has massively improved your game yeah I think they just they just try to bring out the best in you even as a person you know if if you're not happy as an athlete then it can be very difficult to perform if you're always sad and and you don't want to train and stuff so I feel like that's a, that's a really important thing for me I think I think if you're just in in the sport all the time it can be quite overwhelming and and you can find it too much so I really try and focus on sort of having a really good balance like outside of table tennis and making sure I'm spending time with my friends my family and everything like that. So it's important, even with my coaches, I feel like I have good relationships with them off the table. Not so much. Like, it's good to have that yeah. on the table, but I think mm. it's massively important to have that off the table as well. Yeah, definitely. Because I think like the more that you are enjoying yourself outside of what it is that you do for yeah, a living, yeah. um, probably that you bring that to, to whatever your job is. I think that's true of like whatever whatever job you do, you're more likely to kind of bring that to, to work and sort of thing. So I think, especially when I think a lot of like, a lot of sport and stuff like that, it's massively to do with like, how you think mentally about the game. It was obviously it's massively physical, yeah. but a lot of it is 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 driven from the mental side of things as well. And I think it, it's really good that kind of that's what you've been taught and kind of trained in and stuff like that. And they're supportive of that because I think it's probably just as important as as what you can what you can do um on the pit on the on the pitch. Is it called a pitch? Court. On the court. Close enough, close enough. <laughs> pitch, you know, court. Um but um but yeah so um in, you also we, we've chatted a little bit before about you kind of because you moved to Sheffield you didn't didn't finish ended up finishing school no. which um the school is like obviously one literally I live just around the yeah, corner yeah. from um from where you kind of went to school so I know it well and like I didn't realize actually that you actually never finished like I didn't realize that you moved earlier before before you kind of finished school um it's something that like when you speak to younger athletes who are given this opportunity to kind of move and you know get, we get funded to kind of do their training and stuff like that you kind of push them and, and say to try and keep up their schooling yeah. which is the opposite of what you did yeah, yeah. but why why'd you say that to them I think I think there's sort of two sides to it really I think <clears throat> I think you can go down the education route which is massively important you know for your future if if you if being an athlete doesn't work for you mm. but I also think that you know if you have a dream and you have a goal I think you can't put everything else on hold and I, I, it's, it's a difficult one it's a difficult conversation because I think if I were you know I've spoke to kids in schools and and I think it is really important to finish your education but if you have a dream and mm. and you you don't you don't want anyone to get in the way of that it can be it can be quite a difficult thing so when people ask me you know do you regret not finishing school I I, I say no because I wouldn't be in this position I don't yeah. know if I would be in this position right now if, if I didn't make that decision yeah but I think I think the best thing to do is yeah finish your grades I think get yeah. everything done I think I think it's true in a, like a lot of ways <laughs> like obviously everyone will say to you like school's important like it's massively important that you finish school but like no one asked me about my GCSE no, yeah, grades so, anymore yeah, yeah, like yeah. I could have like definitely not done them and it wouldn't make a difference to what I'm doing yeah. in my job right now so I mean I think when you're that age though you think GCSEs and A-levels are like literally the only thing because that's literally what you're yeah, spending yeah, most of yeah. your time doing. And I think what's different is that you just took an alternative route. Don't get me wrong, it was a risky one because yeah. you could never have like foreseen the career that you could have had. But I think what's nice is that you were kind of like willing to willing to gamble on that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone to take that risk, you know, and it's important to kind of have your education yeah. up until that point. But essentially it's what you did Th those grades or what you did on a piece of paper you know when you're yeah. when you're 16 no, yeah, so exactly. like as much and that's me <laughs> coming from a teaching background I do feel like it's really really important but I think th the difference of f four years four and a half years in a secondary school and that final half a year when you sit in your sit in your exams I personally think there's not a huge difference yeah. because it doesn't affect you as you get older but that's that's one perspective and I don't know if people would be like that's very controversial <laughs> everyone should finish school but I think obviously in your scenario like it it really worked out for you yeah um in terms of like, you know, coming on the podcast and kind of what you're trying to do now, like table tennis has quite, you have quite a long, can have quite a long yeah. career in table tennis as well. So like if you had gone down the football route, you're probably, your peak would have probably been about 26 mm -hmm. to maximum, yeah. really, like really in football. But in table tennis, it's more, it's, it's, it's a bit later than that. You've probably got quite a long career. Like how, how does that kind of work? Yeah, I think so. We've got, we've got players 
playing now. Will, for example, he's he's Paralympic. He was Paralympic champion, and we are, he's thirty one, and he's you know he's at the peak of his career. So yeah. I think that that was also something I took into consideration when when I had to make that decision at school. You know, I was I was playing with players that were twenty five, twenty six, and you know they they were just getting started type thing. So I think mm. that was something that that I definitely did think about. I think you know I, I was sixteen or seventeen when I made that decision. And I had maybe I probably have 15 years left in my career, so it was yeah. it was a longevity thing for me. I think that played a big part. I think mm. you know if I was in a sport like football, for example, I mean, you know, like you said, 25, 26, and you haven't got any grades, like, and if you don't make it as a football, like, you know, it could be difficult. But yeah. I think that was that was a big factor for me actually. Yeah, I can imagine so because I think like knowing that it's like you know realistically, you're 23 right mm. now. You're a Paralympic bronze medalist. And like you say, if your peak is like 30, like yeah, you yeah. have so much more that you can can achieve in like your career. And like I think, I think that's really exciting. I, I think knowing yeah, that no, knowing that you are where you are right now, like, but don't get me wrong, you've worked for, for like eight, eight years yeah. in order to get where you are. So I I think it's, you know, I think it's really inspiring. And I think pro, for pro, probably a lot of young people, like they're they're watching you going like, that that's really inspiring. I know one of the things that you kind of want to do alongside your table tennis is promote the idea of like that the disability shouldn't be something that that holds you back. Like, why is that message like so important to you? I think is what well, I think it's because it, it affected me. I think when I was younger, I think it was one of those things that was was quite difficult to get my head around, and <clears throat> I didn't really. I don't really know how to cope. I didn't, you know, there's so much out there now. There's so many things you can, you can go online and find this. We have it, we have it for table tennis as well. We have open days where kids with disabilities can come down and try the sport. And I know a lot of, a lot of Paralympic sports are pushing that as well. And I've been into schools and spoke to kids with disabilities and it's almost like they can't believe that like, I'm, I'm like a professional athlete and I'm disabled. It's like, they, they can't really, and I wish like I could, you know, I said to them like, anything's possible, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're able-bodied or you're disabled. There's so many opportunities out there for you. And I think that's one thing that, that I would like, I wish I knew at that age. And I think that's something that, that I would love to push. I think every opportunity to sort of speak about it, I think, you know, even if there's anyone out there now who's, there's so many opportunities for you as, as a young disabled person that you might not think are out there. There's so much stuff on the internet you can search for. And I would opt with table tennis. I think if I was there, if I was saying to a kid, I'd be like, come, come, come play table tennis, come down. But <laughs> no, yeah, I, like I said, yeah, it's, it's, it's really important for me. Um, and you can see that like in, in like in kind of the conversations that you have like you you can tell that you're like so so passionate because I think this is something that you kind of probably didn't kind of expect to happen with yeah. your life like a, a, you know the as a teenager you probably thought oh my god like I never I never thought like that I'd I'd get to the Paralympic Games like how how is kind of future Billy like what's the plan like what would you what would you love to do with with your career going forwards? I think once once I finish table tennis, which hopefully isn't for a while, I'd yeah. love to. I would love to be a coach. I'd love to coach and like the coaches that we have are so good, and I would love to be in like a Paralympic association coaching, you know, young disabled children and and achieving their goals. Because so I think I think it can it can derail, you know, especially with well, anyone, for example. But I think especially people with disabilities, it can sort of derail them because I think they've always got that in the back of their mind where they think I don't know, maybe like I'm not good enough, or you know. And I think that that that's not the case. I think regardless of whether you're able-bodied or you're disabled, like it shouldn't, it shouldn't make a difference to, to your career going forwards. And, and that's something that I, that I really like to push after I finish, well, even now, but when I finish playing yeah. table tennis, especially, I'd like to focus on that a lot more. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a kind of really, really interesting. You mentioned before that like you get a lot of motivation from seeing the other athletes that you either train with or you compete against and stuff like that. Like that's a big driver and a mo yeah, yeah. motivator for you as well. Um, how does that kind of like play into your game? Cause I know you said that's really helped you like over the years. Yeah. I think, I think when obviously when I, when the Rio situation happened and I was really upset. I, I, I remember I was going back into the hall. I sort of took a few weeks off when I, when I didn't qualify and I came back into the hall and, and I was feeling a bit down in the dumps and I didn't really want to play. And I looked over and there's a guy called uh, Martin Perry. He's my teammate. He used to live, I used to live with him in Sheffield and he plays tail tennis. He's got, he's got no arms and one leg. And like people listening are probably thinking like, how does he play tail tennis? But like, just how he, how he copes with everything, you know, in, in everyday life. And I was just looking and I was thinking like, I'm complaining here that like, I don't want to train. I, I just put it into perspective. And, you know, some people look at it differently. That might not be a driving factor for them, which is, which is also fine. But I just think looking at that and, and looking at him and, and how, you know, even everyday life, how he gets by and every day. And he's so happy. Mm. He's always so, so happy. And he's always laughing and joking. He's got a smile on his face. And I was like, I'm complaining that like, I don't want to train. It's just like, 
and that really that really helped me going forwards and even listening you know to other people's stories it's, it's really inspirational and to even have that in my team is is great for me I think being surrounded by people who are co like consistently like pushing through challenges yeah. and, and difficulties around them that has to rub off to you yeah, rub yeah. off on you in a certain degree because you're literally around people who are pushing through things that are really really difficult mm -hmm. and really really challenging every single day um and I think the more that you kind of are around that the probably you become a bit of a product of that yourself yeah. and it probably is quite motivating which is which is like really nice nice to hear um we're, I'm going to chat to you a little bit more about your 20s in general. So aside from, obviously, what you've managed to achieve on the uh, table tennis court, not pitch, <laughs> um, I'd love to know, like, what's, what's the biggest lesson that you've, like, ever learned that originated from, like, a big mess up or a mistake or something that you kind of went totally wrong and you kind of learned a huge lesson from it? I think I think going back to the, uh, to the, to the sort of way I approached life after I didn't, I didn't qualify for Rio, I think, yeah, I, w I, w I don't think I was a very nice person to be around. To be honest, I was I was quite rude and and I didn't really, you know, I didn't. I was just angry at everyone. I was just really mm. disappointed and and I think the way that I would I w I regret that to be honest. I think I could have looked at that in in a much different way. And I think it took me too long to realize that I was like I've wasted three or four months now of just like being an idiot basically and just mm -hmm. you know rebelling against everyone. And and that was something that I think that conversation with myself took too long to have. I think I was, you know, I'm I'm in a Paralympic table tennis team. I'm so fortunate to be in this position, and and there's so much more looking forward. So I think that was a massive regret. The way the way I acted in in that in that period was something that that I wish, I, yeah, like I said, I wish I had that conversation with myself earlier and picked myself back up. But that was definitely a big regret of mine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think obviously it's amazing, and you you quite openly talk about kind of the challenges that you faced, and that you kind of you definitely say that like you know. I'm not, I'm not the finished product. Like I'm still working on so many different things. And I think it's really important that like we talk a lot about on the podcast that everyone is working through something. Everyone is trying to get better at something in, in their life and, and no one is perfect. Like yeah, no yeah, one no, has it all absolutely. figured out. Is there something at the moment that is kind of for you that's really, um, that you're really trying to work on getting better at? Yeah, I think personally, I think like we were talking about the small wins and the small losses, I think I think something that that I do that I'm I'm really trying to work out at the moment is is not letting my successes you know be too happy and then if I lose be too sad. There's a quote Anthony Joshua said it. It's like don't let um don't let the success go to your head and the failure go to your heart. And that actually really stuck with me. I think mm. that's like a massive quote. I think you see it so many times. Like athletes that have had an amazing tournament, for example, and they're like over the moon and they're like oh my god, like I'm the best. And then they take a loss and it's like they don't talk to anyone. And I think that's something that. That's yeah. what I did with that Rio situation. And it's something that, that I'm really trying to work on just to be try, try and be more level-headed, really. Yeah. I mean, like we chatted before and I said, I think it's a good thing that you celebrate the, those like wins. But I feel like the main thing in this is you've got to find a balance, right? Definitely. You've got to find a, a situation where you're like, yes, really, really happy with that. But like also don't let, let your yeah, head go yeah, too yeah. big as well because I think like you know we're we're from the same like tiny little town and like we frequently go back and we always say nothing has changed yeah, yeah. in no, our absolutely. tiny little town when we go back um nothing's changed um and and you want to go back and obviously have people be like proud of you as well but I never you kind of never want to lose that person that is kind of the person that you were and where you're from yeah, really yeah. because it's really really important for sure so if you could like look back at 20 year old Billy so only like three years yeah. ago but we always start at the beginning of your 20s um and if you could look at back at, at 20 year old Billy where were you at 20 for, for a start I was in Sheffield training yeah okay and you were that was obviously post Rio yeah post Rio yeah. and obviously a few years out well good while yeah, out from Tokyo. Tokyo so where was your headspace at that moment in time I think I was like I, I think I was actually in a really good position uh I was really enjoying training I, I love being in the hall every day and I was looking for, obviously Tokyo got pushed back to 2022. So yeah. it was actually only a year before when I was, so I was 2021 and that was, that was just around the corner. So it was all like systems go for Tokyo really. Yeah. So it, yeah, it was, it was, it was actually a really good time for me. That sort of start where I was, I was really enjoying everything. Even my life outside was perfect. So yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a good little period for me. So if you could go back to like 20 year old Billy and like give him just like one piece of advice that would hopefully carry him through like the whole of his twenties, what, what would you say to him? I think listen listen to what people have to say sometimes I think especially athletes have this sort of thing where they, they think they know best and I, it's definitely not the case like there's so many and there's so many people around you so much support that you have and if you have a goal in mind you'll always just try and do everything you can to do it and and you don't feel like 
you can sort of rely on other people. But I feel like it's so important to have have that team around you where you have, you know, Billy, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't do this, maybe you should do this instead. And I think having those open conversations with people is is really important. They can be difficult ones as well. I think especially if it's something you don't necessarily agree with, but they really believe it, that's that's important for you. I think that's massive. Like mm. you can listen to that bit of information and take it in. And if it, if you don't agree with them, that's fair enough. But I think to be more open minded, I think and and not be so yeah and don't be so narrow minded for sure. Do you think like you were stubborn in that like situation like yeah, when yeah, people no. told you stuff that you didn't want to hear? Yeah, I always thought like I kind of always thought oh yeah, no that's good but I think like I know what I want to do and I'm going to do everything yeah. I can to do it but you got to take a step back and think that you know these guys are trying to do everything they can to make me as good as they can be as well and like I don't know I don't know everything like there's so yeah. much stuff about myself that that other people see that I don't see and I think to to have those conversations with people around you that you're close with and you know it doesn't like turn into an argument when you're having that conversation <laughs> I think that that's that's massive and that's yeah. something that I've really tried to use now uh, going forwards. Yeah definitely is that so is there something that springs to mind when you say, like, say that where someone said something to you and you were like not hearing it at all and you kind of feel like you wish that you'd taken that advice on sooner? Yeah the, the, no, nothing really specific I just think how I approach sort of certain conversations was like they'd be telling me all this stuff like Billy you need to do this and I think this would be really good for you and I'd be like yeah 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 and then I'd go back and, I, and I'd have listened to what they've said but I wouldn't really take it in Yeah. and I think like I, I try now just to pick like everybody's brains like I've been abroad to training camps a few times and I've spoke to different coaches and, and I think I'm a lot I listen to what people say and I really really try and think about it and and try and think is this is this information good for me is it going to help me or is it mm. not and I think before I was just like nothing anyone said would be beneficial and I, <laughs> like, I thought I knew which is definitely not I the case. I think we've all been there. Yeah, like, yeah. I've definitely been there when I've gone, no, no, you can't possibly yeah. know what's right for me more yeah. than I know what's right for me. And and I actually have had a, a, an experience, it's funny you say that, because I've actually had an experience recently where I was like, I dead set on something and like someone had to kind of sit down and have a very like serious chat with me and say like, no, I think like you're actually putting yourself at hindrance yeah. by carrying on thinking this way. And they had to literally say it bluntly because they tried to say it politely. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. I know what's right. I know what's right. And they were right. They yeah, were yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. right. And it like pains me to say that they were absolutely <laughs> my life. spot on. Yeah. But like, sometimes it's worth just list, like, you, you know, when you're young, you kind of feel like you're, you're, you're fearless, you know what's right for you, especially when you kind of break into that kind of early adulthood because you're given all this responsibility, right? You're going, right, you, well, you f go figure it out and it's for mm. you to decide all these things. And sometimes it's, it's it, you know, you don't want to listen to what you people around you are saying because you kind of think what well, that's what's better for you. But then also, you know, that actually they probably know what's right. Yeah. Like, so it's a, tr it's a tricky point and I can totally understand what you're saying. And I don't think anyone's actually ever said that on the podcast yeah. in terms of like, that's what they really wish their younger self had done because I am going through that now I'm 20, 26 yeah. and I'm experiencing probably very, very similar things where you're listening to people who are experienced, who know more than you, or they've just got a different perspective on what yeah. you have. And sometimes it's really good to have a different perspective sure. on things because yeah, new perspectives can open up a whole new, whole new different thing. So um, you got your medal here. You can't, you yeah, can't be in the studio show, right? without showing us your medal. Come on, <laughs> it's actually so much heavier than I thought it was going to be. There's a few be. scratches on it now, unfortunately. You said but... that you took it into a school yeah. and a kid dropped it. It was like the first day, so <gasps> I literally I got back from Tokyo. I think it was a week, and I went into a school, and I was like obviously so happy with the medal. And, and yeah, and one of the kids was like, "Can I hold it? Can I hold it?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." So he picks it fixed the medal up and he just like he was like he, I don't think he couldn't believe like how heavy it was and he just dropped it on the floor and I sort of like looked at the teacher I was just like <laughs> and it, but yeah no it's it's, it's amazing I, I don't, it's one of those things like I said before it was it was something that I've always wanted to achieve and, and to be there with that you know the podium was was something that being on the podium and with Ross and Aaron especially that I've yeah. grew up with and and have taught me so much I think to be on on the podium with them was was a, was a really because they're a little moment. bit older than you as well, aren't they? Yeah. So you've obviously done quite a lot of training with them. You've kind of learned and kind of grown a lot from them. They've been kind of crucial to your training, definitely. Yeah, I think even even the normal stuff, like I said to you before, we're just moving up to Sheffield. I lived with those two at the time. Yeah, and um, to be to be around them and and they were you know they told me everything how to wash my clothes. It sounds stupid <laughs> now, but like washing my <laughs> this clothes. This is what the podcast my... all about, yeah, like yeah. adult life. So washing your clothes is like a huge part of that. And I think it's mad that you. I still can't believe that you did all that at fifteen because. I mean, I moved out at 18 when I went to uni and that was still like, felt like such yeah. a crazy thing. I definitely couldn't have 
managed it like earlier. So I think I think what we've done is amazing. Um, so yeah, Billy, well, thank you so much no, no, for coming for into the studio. Me. It's been so nice to chat with you. And like, I'm so excited to see like what's next to you. I know you're working really, really hard. And I think, I think it's amazing what you've achieved in Tokyo. And I'm excited to see what you do next. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Talk 20s podcast. I hope it inspired you in some way and pops a little pep in your step for this week. Got a spare minute? It would mean the absolute world if you could subscribe, leave a review or share this episode with a friend. We're on a mission to help as many 20-somethings navigate their 20s as we can and we really cannot do it without your support. We also love to hear from you. You can find us on all platforms via the handle at Talk 20s. And if you're struggling with something in your 20s that we haven't already covered in the podcast, DM us and let us know so we can cover it in a future episode. And for more stories of inspiration and resources to help you make the best of your 20s, head to our website, talk20s.com.